well, thank you very much for that introduction. And when, he, when I was introducing the class earlier today, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't pork that was the subject of my, liter of my culinary refinement. And, but we'll save that for the other side of the magic wall. Uh, I want to thank uh, Ben Story and Jenna Story and Ty Testator for inviting me to this. I'm quite honored to be able to be here and be part of this um, very exciting series and uh, to meet all of you. Uh, here at Furman. I've heard much about Furman over the years, but I, this is the first time I visited, and uh, it's a lovely campus, and I like Greenville, and I hope to come back sometime. So thank you again for the invitation. So I uh, am going to talk about God and man in Rousseau today. And first of all, let me begin with a confession. What I'm going to, which is apt for Rousseau, the author of the confessions. My confession, however, is a little less tawdry than his. My confession is that what I'm about to present to you is my senior honors thesis that I wrote 30 years ago as of right now. I first got interested in Rousseau uh, by way of the question of, of what the role of religion was in his thought because that was a new subject for me having grown up in a um, non-religious environment let's say and being part of the United States very secular regime at least in my thinking. And so when I first read Rousseau on religion, I was perplexed. You know, what, what is the role of religion? Why does he think religion is necessary? So I wrote a senior honors thesis ago, defended uh, in April of 1985, so three years and a couple months from now. And in a certain way, much of the work I've done outside of Olympic figure skating and uh, you know, barbecue reviews has uh, really revolved around the very same questions and issues and probably some of the same words that I'll use tonight for the last 30 years. I suppose that that could be testimony to the excitement of uh, being an academic and being involved in the intellectual life or perhaps testimony to my lack of movement in 30 years. So as I said, the title of the talk tonight is God and Man at Yale, uh, excuse me, in Rousseau. And that is a kind of a call out for those of you who are uh, a little bit older to a work uh, written uh, quite a while ago, 1951, by William F. Buckley, Jr., God and Man at Yale. And in that work, uh, Buckley diagnosed what he saw as the problem of education at his time, particularly the education that he received as an undergraduate at Yale University. And in that book, God and Man at Yale, uh, Buckley looked at God, namely the way in which religious belief and a Judeo-Christian heritage was treated by his professors, and that is to say, not well, uh, and likewise at man, namely how economic relations were treated by his professors, and that is to say, in Buckley's view at least, um, uh, to put it too strongly in a socialist manner, or at least in, not in a manner consistent, his view, with economic liberalism. So how is God treated and how is man treated in his education? Now it struck me apart from being a very clever title on my part, um, I thought, you know, really Rousseau is interested in some of the same questions even if he comes out very differently on some of them. Um, I'm gonna talk about religion tonight but I actually recently did a paper on Rousseau on economics. And let's just say that Rousseau does not share uh, many of Buckley's concerns about economics, but he has his own way of thinking about it. And I'd be happy to talk about that if you wish. But today, religion is my subject. And what I want to talk about are a couple of questions regarding Rousseau. First of all, what is the relationship between God and man, according to Rousseau? Or what should be the relationship between God and man, according to Rousseau? Uh, alternatively, why, according to Rousseau, is religion necessary for human beings? I'm going to suggest Rousseau argues that religion is necessary for human beings. Why is it necessary? And what sort of religion is necessary for human beings? And finally, how is that religion related to Christianity? Okay. Now, I'm first, the, my plan of attack here is first I'm going to briefly set up these questions by looking at uh, Rousseau's early work, particularly the Discourse on the Sciences and the Arts, and only very briefly Discourse on Inequality. But then I want to turn, after that brief setup, to look at Rousseau's two major discussions of religion, which a number of you I know are reading in, in your class and others not. So I won't presume that everyone here is intimately familiar. Um, that is first, what I'll call the individual religion, or the religion of man, to use Rousseau's terms, that he presents in his work, Emile, and more specifically in a part of that work called The Profession of Faith of the Savoyard Vicar. 
and then secondly, on what Rousseau has to say about civil religion in a social contract. So individual or uh, religion in Emile and civil religion in the social contract. So let me cast my, our mind back to Rousseau's first major writing. And that is the discourse on the sciences and the arts. This work made Rousseau an overnight celebrity in Europe. It won a prize from an academy, the Academy of Dijon, in 1750 and was published in 1751. The question asked by the Academy of Dijon was whether the restoration of the sciences and the arts has contributed to purifying morals. Keep in mind that this was written smack dab in the center of the century of enlightenment. So one would think that the restoration of the sciences and arts, the growth of enlightenment, of course would contribute to purifying morals. Rousseau's answer, quote, our souls have been corrupted in proportion as our sciences and our arts has advanced toward perfection. In other words, Rousseau takes the negative. Uh, by the way, he was not the only person who entered the competition who took the negative. This was a live issue at the time. But it was the character of Rousseau's answer that was so I interesting um, to them and to us, I hope. <clears throat> in the discourse, uh, this first discourse, as it's called, Rousseau is particularly concerned with the ways in which the sciences and the arts, or philosophy as well, science and philosophy being essentially synonymous terms at this time, the ways in which science and philosophy undermine belief, including religious belief, and other opinions necessary to morality and politics, according to him. So science and, uh, or, or philosophy tends to undermine beliefs and, uh, 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 and opinions that are necessary for us to be moral beings and good citizens. So for example, in the work, uh, Rousseau turns to the scientists or philosophers, and first he, he argues that they don't contribute to society as citizens. They're idle, right? They're, 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 they're academics like me. Uh, and he goes on, he writes, what? Am I saying idle? And would to God they were indeed. Morals would be healthier and society more peaceful, but those vain and futile declaimers go everywhere, armed with their deadly paradoxes, undermining the foundations of faith and annihilating virtue. They laugh disdainfully at those old-fashioned words fatherland and religion and consecrate their talents and their philosophy to destroying and degrading all that is sacred among men. I'm sure things are different here at Furman, but I can tell you at University of California, Davis, this is indeed what we do. <laughs> okay? So uh, Rousseau is concerned in that work about the ways in which enlightenment, science, and philosophy end up undermining popular beliefs and morals that he believes are necessary to virtue and to politics. There's much more to that work, but just as a, a brief thing. But um, let me t take you back now into Rousseau's history a little bit to see what he's grappling with himself as a person and then where he's going to go with it. Okay? So as I mentioned, the Discourse on the Sciences and Arts is published in 1751. Rousseau was born in 1712. So in other words, he was nearly 40 years old when he became famous, which would be great consolation for many of you uh, and not such great consolation for some of us. Now, Rousseau was born in Geneva, and he signs many of his important works, including the Discourse on Science and Arts and the other writings I'm going to speak about, as the citizen of Geneva. So Rousseau himself poses as a citizen in his writings. He's concerned with citizenship and healthy citizenship in his writings and the tension between that and philosophy. Okay? But he didn't get there right away. Okay? Rousseau uh, left Geneva at the age of 16. He ran away from home. And he uh, w had led a wandering life for the, uh, the rest of his life, really. He was largely self-taught in a variety of subjects, um, not just uh, he started his life as a musician. He was self-taught as a musician, largely. Later on, he was self-taught as a chemist. Later on, as uh, other kinds of things. Very um, unconventional education, which, by the way, he himself thought that his unconventional upbringing and education enabled him to see things that people with more conventional upbringings and such were unable to do so. Rousseau arrived in Paris around 1741. So he's about 30 years old, 10 years before the discourse is here. And he, like everyone else who arrives in Paris now, as in then, wants to go to become famous. 
right? So Rousseau started out his life wanting to be a member of this sort of club of philosophers and artists in Paris. He arrives in Paris with a new system of musical notation, which he, uh, he presents the Academy of Sciences, and they say, oh, it's very good, but decline to support him, uh, and two operas that he's composed. Okay? He is not a success. About 10 years go by of him scraping together a living in various ways in Paris, but at that same time period, he became intimate friends with Diderot, d'Alembert, and the other philosophers who were at the heart of the Enlightenment project. Okay? Uh, he always had rather tense relationships with Voltaire, uh, and I won't go into that now. So Rousseau becomes best friends with Diderot, and Diderot becomes the editor of the Encyclopedia. And the Encyclopedia is effectively the Bible of the Enlightenment. The attempt to gather together all the known knowledge, not just philosophical knowledge, but knowledge about trades and machines. It's filled with illustrations of how various machines work. The idea being, we're going to disseminate the results of science and philosophy to everyone in order to improve society. Okay? Diderot and D'Alembert become editors of the Encyclopedia, and they invite none other than Jean-Jacques Rousseau to write all the articles on musical theory for the work. So Rousseau dutifully writes all the articles for musical theory. He's part of this group of philosophers and scientists trying to improve uh, society and perhaps even morals of society here. However, Rousseau had a funny thing happen to him on the way to vi visit Diderot in prison. Diderot sort of played at the edges of writing things that got him in trouble. Eventually he got in trouble, he's in prison. Rousseau goes to visit Diderot on an afternoon carrying a copy of a magazine with him. He opens up the magazine and what does he see but the question by the Academy of Dijon I read earlier. Has the restoration of the arts and sciences tended to purify morals? And he says he had a vision of the answer to the question and of his entire philosophical thought that he spent the next um, 30 year, 20 years trying to put out in his writings. Okay? He came to see, as he explained there, uh, that, that in fact the science and arts had corrupted or tended to corrupt morals, not only in his own age, but in all ages. And in fact, society has a corrupting effect on human nature in general. Okay? And in that context, he came to argue that uh, against original sin. So this, the cornerstone of his entire writings, beginning with that first discourse, but certainly later on, is that man is naturally good and the society corrupts him. Man is naturally good, not evil. Later on, he's much more open about the fact that this directly contradicts and is intended by him to directly contradict the doctrine of original sin. But going back to the discourse on inequality, uh, excuse me, on the sciences and arts, that comes out, in, like I said, in 1751, and Rousseau is an immediate sensation across Europe, ultimately. He's the first person, they say, in Western history, European history, to be known by his first name, right? So I used to say that he was the Cher of his day, but that doesn't get any laughs, so I'll call him that he's the Beyonce or Jay-Z. Is that one name? I don't know, Jean-Jacques isn't either. So he was the Jay-Z of his day. Maybe that's a little old too, but you'll have to update me behind the screen. Okay. Um, however, at this very same time, the discourse on the sciences and arts came out saying that the Enlightenment corrupted morals, so did the first volume of the Encyclopedia containing Rousseau's articles on music for it. So he's immediately, of course, uh, accused of being inconsistent or hypocritical or something. So many of Rousseau's writings in this period are meant to try and explain how he's consistent. But we won't go into that now. Okay. Rousseau writes another discourse, the Discourse on Inequality in 1755, in which he first fully states the argument is that man is naturally good. And that evil comes not from man's fall or from God, but rather through the accident of us becoming social beings when we're naturally not social beings. Okay. So at the cornerstone of Rousseau's entire thought is a challenge to Christianity, or at least certain versions of Christianity, concerning original sin. Okay. Now, back to this story here. In this period, Rousseau ultimately breaks with Diderot 
and the other friends of his because they saw that he was serious about what he was arguing. At first, they thought, this is really funny. We're so arguing that the, you know, the Enlightenment makes us corrupt. But then they thought, this guy's serious. Right, so Rousseau actually moves out of Paris, moves into the countryside, and breaks with his former friends. Now, apropos of our sub present subject, let me read to you what he says later on in his life, at the very end of his life, in a work called The Reveries of the Solitary Walker, about what he was going through at that time period. He writes this, speaking of this time period. I was living then among the modern philosophers who hardly resembled the ancient ones. Instead of removing my doubts and ending my irresolution, they'd shaken all the certainty I thought I had concerning the things that were most important for me to know about religion and morality, in other words. Ardent missionaries of atheism and very imperious dogmatists, there was no way they would, without anger, put up with anyone daring to think other than they did about any point whatsoever. So having had his, his, his doubts awakened and uncertainty sown in him by these atheistic people, Rousseau says he re-examined his own views about God and man, and he said that the results were more or less like those contained in the profession of faith, which I'll turn to in a moment. So what were Rousseau's own views on religion? I'm hard, sorry to disappoint you, but I think the question is we don't know. Uh, first of all, he had very reasons to be kind of cautious about revealing what they were, given what happened to him ultimately. Namely, after he published even the views in the profession of faith and the social contract, he was exiled, his, the rest came for him, he fled the country, and he spent the rest of his life wandering from one exile to another. So people had reason to be cautious about these matters at this time period. But also, I think he's just systematically cagey about what he believes for various reasons. So I don't think we can know the answer to that question. Okay? What we can know is this, for, with certainty, that time and again, Rousseau argues that religious belief, certain, certain religious beliefs at least, are necessary for human beings, at least almost all human beings, right? if they are going to be virtuous and happy beings as well as good citizens. Moreover, okay, in defending the profession of faith and the social contract after they were condemned and burned by the hangman and all the things that happened to books back in those days, now people don't take, look, you look over in Barnes and Noble, there are hardly books at all. It's as though someone burned them all, uh, right? Well, it, back in Rousseau's time, they literally did burn the books, right, and including his books. By the public hangman, that's the part I really like. Right, the public hanging, he's got his hood on, you know, and he's burning a book. So they took these things seriously then, and I think maybe we ought to take them seriously. Okay? In defending these works that were condemned, Rousseau argues that religions need to be assessed according to two criteria. And I was going to draw it up in the blackboard, but you're going to have to imagine a two-by-two two plot here. Okay? So the, <clears throat> the two criteria are these. Truth, are they true? Second, utility. Are they useful? Okay, that gives us four possible categories, right? They're useful and true, possibility. They're useful but not true. Another set, they're not useful but true. The other set, they're both untrue and unuseful. Okay, untrue and unuseful religions, let's put those aside as not being very interesting to us or to Rousseau, okay? But for Rousseau, he's going to argue that there's a tension, or I'm going to suggest he's arguing, there's a tension between the truth and utility of religions that's at the heart of what he's going to portray in his own treatments of religion. Okay? So, again, what we want to see is where does he place the following um, categories within my two-by-two two that you can visualize behind you, right? Behind me, excuse me. Where does the profession of faith go? the religious teaching he's going to present there. Where does the civil religion of the social contract go? And finally, where does Christianity go, as Rousseau understands it? So, let me turn to the profession of faith in the Savoyard Vicar. 
Again, assuming that um, some of you are not intimately familiar with it, let me just tell you just base a little bit about it, okay? Uh, this work, uh, the profession of faith as Saviard Vicar is a portion of a larger work entitled A Meal or on Education. It was published in May 1762. This is the book that the hangman burned in Paris, that the archbishop condemned, that the authorities ordered Rousseau's arrest for. It's quite dramatic, actually. When they were coming to get Rousseau in one carriage, Rousseau was going out of the place where he was staying in the other carriage. So they literally passed each other, right? Uh, they've got the arrest warrant, and they're looking at this guy. And Rousseau didn't put, like, a you know, cover up. No, he was wearing a full caftan and headgear and waving to them and stuff. So it was quite a dramatic exit. Okay, um, this work was published just a month after the social contract. And I'm going to look at a little bit of the tension between the two works. So 1762. Uh, the work as a whole is is takes the form of a description of how to educate uh, an individual whom he names Emile, hence the title of the work, in order to make him uh, happy in essence, and virtuous. Uh, so it's an educational treatise, at least in how it appears to us. Okay? Although Rousseau himself said that if you think it's an education treatise, you haven't understood him right. Okay? What it is, I'll leave for Q&A. Uh, it also, by the way, contains a pricey of the basic teaching about politics and the social contract. So notice Rousseau saw them as being consistent in some way, and I'll come back to that. Okay? So, the profession of faith, like I said, is a, an explicitly separate part of the work. There were several separate parts of the work. This is one of them. Profession of faith, and it comes in book four of Emile. Now, the context, I think, is important for understanding what Rousseau is trying to do. Book four of the work is about when Emile becomes, is a, it enters puberty. So you have the budding passions of adolescence, including the sexual passion. Okay. So that's the context here. Emile's passions are starting to grow and become unruly. His imagination might take over and begin to corrupt him. Okay. So what are we going to do about that? I think this is important for understanding the profession. All of a sudden, in the middle of book four, Rousseau says, suddenly, really, quote, I foresee how many readers will be surprised at seeing me trace the whole first stage of my pupil without speaking to him of religion. Right? It's as though not only did your uh, parents put off until you're you know, 15 years old going to Sunday school, they didn't even tell you Sunday school existed. Now, Emile doesn't have any friends, so he's not going to learn about it from them. Uh, but, uh, so it's shocking that he's waited this long. And he asks, to what sect shall we join the man of nature, Emile? The answer is quite simple, it seems to me, he says. We shall join him to neither this one nor that one, but we shall put him in a position to choose the one which the best use of his reason ought to lead him. Okay? So somehow we're going to prepare his reason to reason about his relationship to God and nature and so on and so forth. Right? We're not going to indoctrinate him in any one sect. We're going to put him in a position to reason about these matters himself. But instead of doing that, Rousseau suddenly shifts gears. Right, right after saying this, he suddenly says, quote, Instead, in, instead of telling you here on my own what I think, I shall tell you what a man more worthy than I thought. I guarantee the truth of the facts which are going to be reported. This really happened to the author of the paper I'm going to transcribe. It's up to you to see if useful reflections can be drawn from it about the subject with which it deals. I'm not propounding to you the sentiments of another on my own as a rule. I'm offering them to you for examination. Okay, let me back up. Rousseau claims that he's transcribing a paper that someone else wrote. He's not the, uh, responsible for it. He's just as an editor, right? It's sort of like uh, fancy plagiarism, okay? He's only, he only testifies to the truth of the facts in it, not to any of the contents of the arguments about God and religion. He um, says that he's going to leave it to you to determine if it's useful, hence utility, Right is the key question here. And finally, I'm, he's not going to present this as a rule, but rather as a model for you. Okay. So having said this, Alison Rousseau begins an explicit digression in quotation marks as though he's quoting or transcribing this paper. And it begins this way. 30 years ago, in an Italian city, 
a young expatriate found himself reduced to utter destitution. He was born a Calvinist, etc., etc., etc. So it's a once upon a time story, right? That you strongly suspect, given that it was 30 years ago, given that he was born a Calvinist, given that he'd run away from home and was in utter destitution, he's talking about himself. But he doesn't say that yet, or even maybe ever. Okay? It's, he's presenting it like this little story here. And this young man meets a kindly vicar, the Saviard vicar of the title in Confession of Faith, who wants to basically steers him right. Okay? But let me note a couple of things about this strange separate section. Okay? First, as I already mentioned, Rousseau claims that he's only transcribing it and it's written by some other person. Second, he puts the whole thing in quotation marks, thereby setting it aside as a kind of transcription. He even adds notes to it in his role as editor, right? And now those will be important. He says he can attest to the facts of this story, which would be, of course, appropriate if he's the, sto the little boy he's talking about, um, but he doesn't talk about the truth, okay? And finally, he even gives the speech given by the, prof by the vicar, the profession of faith, the vicar's own profession of his faith, Right, a separate title and a separate section and everything else. So it's like a box within a box within a box. So you have Emil, the whole work, book four within that, the digression within that, then the profession of faith within that. Now why does Rousseau do this? This is all rather mysterious. Okay? And finally, after he's done with it, he goes back to the main story. I've transcribed this writing, he writes, and he goes back to the story of Emil. Okay. What are we to make of all this sort of dramatic introduction, quoting, pretending not to be the author, and so on and so forth? Now, a number of people have said he pretended not to be the author because he thought he'd get in trouble for publishing the things that the vicar said. Well, if that was his purpose, he was really way off in judging the reaction, uh, at minimum. Okay. So briefly, what are the contents of this profession of faith? The, vicar, the vicar's speech comes in two parts. Okay? Part one puts forward a series of dogmas, theological dogmas, about the existence of God and so on and so forth. And part two uh, discusses particular revelation and the problem of fanaticism and the need for toleration. So the first one you might call theoretical, the second part practical. Okay? So what about part one? I only want to just sketch what, what the argument is there, not go into the particulars at all, because that's not really um, what we're about here. Um, so first of all, the vicar uh, uh, goes through a kind of Cartesian doubt. I'm going to doubt everything about the world and only find what I find in myself to be true. It's somewhat different than Descartes uh, 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 about um, what I can know about God. But I'm only going to use my reason. Right, so this is meant to be a natural religion or a form of deism. The vicar does not appeal to any revelation, to the Bible, or anything else. It's all done by meditating upon the, the nature and our place in it. Okay, what does the, the vicar establish? Okay, whether or not Rousseau believes it or not is another matter. First, that a will moves the universe. Second, that the order of nature shows this will to be intelligent, and he calls this God or the divinity. Third, that man is free and also the cause of evil. So implicit in this is something like the natural goodness of man, and it's man's choices that are the origin of evil, not God in some way. Okay, so, right? And finally, that the soul is immaterial and immortal. So there's a difference between body and soul. Body is perishes, but the soul is immaterial and therefore doesn't perish. And in fact, it's immortal and possibly subject to divine uh, punishments or rewards, although he's sketchy on that at this point. Okay? Note, Rousseau himself never attests to the truth of these arguments. In fact, after the vicar's done with the first part of the profession, there's a little dramatic interlude of a conversation between the young Jean-Jacques, or whoever this is, listening to it, and the vicar. And Rousseau writing is, <laughs> well, whoever's writing this thing that Rousseau is transcribing that has this conversation embedded in it has the young boy say this. Um, the young boy 30 years later. 
The good priest had spoken with vehemence. He was moved, and so was I. I believed I was hearing the divine Orpheus sing the first hymns and teaching the men the worship of the gods. Nevertheless, I saw a multitude of object, objections to make to him. So even the young boy listening to a vicar doesn't think that the arguments work. Right? What Rousseau himself thinks, I don't know. Okay, so the, the truth value of what the vicar has to say in the first part is not clear. Okay, or what Rousseau thinks is the truth value, um, or we as readers might think. Okay, as I mentioned, the second part of the, of the, uh, the profession of faith involves a critique of revelations, of miracles, or of anything that goes beyond the universal natural religion that's accessible to everyone through their religion uh, in the first part. And, and it furthermore argues that these, these revelations and desires for scriptures, particular scriptures, or miracles, and so on and so forth, is a form of pride on our part and leads us to be intolerant and fanatical. So. The critique of religion, uh, excuse me, of revelation, of miracles, and so on and so forth in this part has a very clear purpose, right? It's meant to be useful in order to make human beings more tolerant and less fanatical. Okay. okay, so with all that in mind, let me step back now and try and assess why the profession is where it is, what it's doing, and what Rousseau's purposes are. And I should have uh, noted, by the way, if anyone has a cl question of clarification of what I'm saying, I'd be happy to um, address it. Okay. okay, let me focus on three things that I've already spoken about a bit, but try and draw some conclusions. First of all, why is it where it is in the work? Okay, in the middle of book four, et cetera. Secondly, who's the audience of the profession? And finally, how does it relate to truth and utility, or our two-by-two figure we're imagining here. Okay, first of all, the position. As I mentioned, book four is taken up with the general question of the budding adolescent passions. The sexual passion, but also potentially pride and resentment and all sorts of other uh, issues that you probably had in junior high as well. Okay, so my suggestion would be this. The placement of the profession of faith in that place of the work shows that it's meant to be prophylactic. That is, to prevent, I hope you all know the word, uh, that it's meant to prevent, in this case, the passions from getting out of control. Okay? So just think about the idea of having an all-seeing God watching your every action. That's, that's one way of preventing people from disobeying. Um, or uh, and maybe it's not an all-seeing God, but it's a kind of belief in the goodness and order of the universe and your own role in it. But be that as it may, they're meant as to direct the passions and prevent them from developing in corrupting ways. Okay. And there are hints of this in the profession itself. Like I said, it begins with 30 years ago, a young expatriate, you know, blah, blah, blah. And before the vicar presents his profession, we have a little story about the interaction between this young boy and the kindly vicar. What do we learn about the young boy, whether it's young Jean-Jacques Rousseau or not? Okay. What we learn about the young boy is that he's corrupt. He's vain. He's angry. He's angry at some people have stuff, and he doesn't, even though he knows he's better than they are. There's a story of Rousseau's life. Uh, there's also hints of his sexual awakening, right? And so this kind of boy needs something like the teaching of the profession, right? To restrain his pride, to restrain his other corrupt passions. Is it, in fact, necessary for all children at this age? Notice that we don't know what religious teaching Emile may have received, Rousseau's imaginary pupil. What we do see is that be the teaching be pre presented to this young, corrupt boy. So it's an open question whether or not the religious teaching, like we see in the profession of faith, with God, the immortal soul, et cetera, is necessary, even necessary for Emile. But it's certainly necessary for the young Jean-Jacques. Okay? What about the vicar? He's an interesting character here. Okay? What we learn about the vicar is he's disgraced. He's a disgraced vicar who's been given a small country Paris. Why is he disgraced? 
Well, because he likes sleeping with other people's wives. He has his scruples, though. He doesn't sleep with unmarried women. That would be wrong. Just married ones. Okay? <clears throat> Furthermore, after... I don't, I don't claim to... I'm not, you know, I'm not approving of this. I'm just relating it. Okay. So he's been disgraced and sent into a poor um, uh, thing. Furthermore, after having been disgraced, he goes through the process he recounts examining his views, deciding what reason tells him about religion. Now keep in mind, he's a Catholic priest. In the teaching that he reveals in the profession of faith, there are no Catholic dogmas. Uh, the existence of God, okay, that one, but original sin, no. Right? The truth of revelation, the divinity of Jesus, none of these things are in there. As a matter of fact, he critiques all those things as part of particular revelation. So the vicar does not believe the Catholic teachings, but he still preaches them as though he does. In other words, let me put it too strong, the vicar's a liar, right? The vicar pretends to be an Orthodox priest in front of his parishioners, but only reveals the truth about what he truly believes to this young boy, okay? Isn't it odd that a model of truth and sincerity would actually be a liar? That might give us a little bit of pause about what Rousseau believes in presenting what he does. Okay, and listen to what the vicar says to the young boy. After the young boy says, I had a bunch of objections to make to him, the vicar says this, ah, but in your present condition, young man, you will profit from thinking as I do. In other words, the vicar points not to the truth, and the young boy points not to the truth of what the vicar has said, but its utility. It will make you virtuous and happy, whether or not it's true. Okay? And to this statement, Rousseau, in his role of editor of the profession of faith, writes this. So the vicar said, but in your present condition, you will profit from thinking as I do. Rousseau adds this note. This is, I believe, what the good vicar could say to the public at present. So what's the audience of the profession, the intended audience of the profession? First, a young corrupt boy who needs this religious teaching to make him virtuous and happy, rather than prideful and resentful. And secondly, the public. <clears throat> so again, the emphasis here has been on the utility of the teaching rather than on its truth. Now in this regard, Rousseau at the very end of the profession adds a very lengthy note in his own role as editor that I think is revealing. It also takes us back to his own struggles with Diderot and the other philosophers, the atheist philosophers, as he calls them. When the vicar concludes his speech, he warns the young boy against the skepticism of the philosophers, in very similar language to what Rousseau himself used in the discourse on the sciences and arts. Right, they go around trying to make you doubt stuff and undermine your beliefs. He says, by overturning, destroying, and trampling on all that men respect, they, these skeptical philosophers, deprive, deprive the afflicted of the last consolation of their misery and the powerful and the rich of the only break on their passions. Right? So skepticism of the philosophers undermines the conditions that will make the unfortunate happy by giving them consolation and give the fortunate the rich, the powerful, a break on their passions. So the utility of religion in this light is to offer consolation to those who have suffered evil and to try and restrain those who want to do evil. So again, the emphasis is on the utility of religion here. And at the end of this passage, Rousseau sends his reader to a note, again in his role as editor, in which he himself, is, is apparently he himself, so now we're in this boxes and the boxes, and we're not sure where we are, but he himself um, assesses the dangers posed by what he calls the philosophic party. So Rousseau is not, the, the, the philosophers themselves at this time saw themselves as a kind of party. They call themselves the party of humanity, as opposed to the party of, of fanaticism or the party of uh, authoritarian government or whatever. We're the party of humanity. Right? They embraced the notion that they were a party, a group of people working for a goal. Rousseau says, yeah, you're a party, all right, but not for humanity. <laughs> right? You're a party um, for something different. Okay? 
you're a party of as, fan as fanatical in your own skepticism and your own dogmatic beliefs as the people you claim to be opposing are in their dogmatism and intolerance. He even suggests there that religious fanaticism is preferable to philosophical fanaticism because he writes, fanaticism, religious fanaticism, although sanguinary and cruel, is nevertheless a grand and strong passion which elevates the heart of man. Philosophy, in turn, according to Rousseau, makes men either egoistic or indifferent. And he writes, from the point of view of principles of morality, there is nothing that philosophy can do well that religion cannot do still better. And religion does many things that philosophy could not do. Right? So the resources of religion, again, without speaking of its truth, but rather its utility for human beings and morality, is better than philosophy. And as I mentioned, the, the vicar says that v religion gives consolation to the miserable and breaks the passions, uh, 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 the, the, the iniquitous desires of the strong. And without any word here about its truth. Okay, so let's go back to the two by two chart that we're imagining here, right? So let's say true, untrue, useful, not useful. Okay? It's clear that the vicar in his voice, that the young boy in his voice, that the editor in his voice, and Rousseau in his own voice as author, all agree there's something about the teaching offered in the profession of faith that's useful, okay? or at least more useful than the existing alternatives. Right? Is it true? We don't know. So you have to kind of imagine a true, not true question mark in both those places. Maybe true in part, maybe not true, maybe not true at all, uh, but it's, it's difficult to say. But useful is the uh, category that Rousseau insists on there. Let me turn to the social contract now. We're going to do the same kind of exercise more briefly. As I mentioned, the social contract, which is the first work in Western political thought that argues that democracy is the only legitimate form of government, which was a very radical idea. Uh, when he wrote it, and a very radical idea around the world today, uh, let's not forget, for many people. Okay? Um, in the social contract, Rousseau also offers a religious teaching or a religious discussion of religion, but in this case, it's about civil religion, religion as it's related to politics, as opposed to the universalist or individual religion, you might say, that we saw in the profession. We'll come back to that conflict a little later. Okay? So, broadly speaking, the social contract has two aims, I would say. Theory and practice, okay? Much like the profession of faith. First part, theory, what about God, the immortal soul? Second part, practice, um, and, and, and toleration, fanaticism, and so on. So, the, the, the part about theory in the social contract is concerned with legitimacy. What are, as the subtitle of the work has it, the principles of political right? So Rousseau is interested in deriving and explaining the principles of political right. What are the, the rules of, of legitimate government that we can deduce by reasoning about, uh, about the nature of the state, we might say. Okay? But the second part has to do with practice. How do we make it work? Right? It might be great to have these principles, but if we can't reach them, then they're at best aspirational, perhaps useless. So how can we put them into practice, or to what extent can we put them into practice? These two aims are present in the very beginning of the work, so let me just read the very beginning. I want to inquire, he says, introducing his book, I want to inquire whether there can be any legitimate and reliable, legitimate and reliable, rule of administration in the civil state, taking men as they are and laws as they can be. In this inquiry, I will always try to join what right permits with what interest prescribes, so that justice and utility are not always at odds. So again, how do we reconcile what's right or just, or what law demands from us on the one hand, with what's in our interest or what's useful for us and what's reliable on the other? Okay. So Rousseau outlines these principles of political right, culminating in book two, chapter six, on law. He outlines what a law is, and his argument is that the uh, only thing that, that deserves to be called a law has to come from the people and their, their, their democratic self-government, 
erecting a law that applies to all and comes from all. Okay. But then, having done this, the end of the theoretical part, he turns to the practical problem. And he writes this. How will a blind multitude, which often does not know what it wants because it rarely knows what's good for it, carry out by itself an undertaking as vast, as difficult as a system of legislation? From this arises the need for a lawgiver. And in the next chapter, book two, chapter seven, on the lawgiver. So he's talking about like mosaic founders, something like this, right? Who, who take a herd of, you know, uh, the unruly Israelites, drag them around the desert for 40 years, bring down some tablets, go down, back up, get tablets, come down, and then finally send them into Israel and make them the Israelites when they were once the slaves in subjection in Egypt. So a kind of mosaic undertaking of reforming and reforming a people into a people, okay? The problem Rousseau identifies in this case, putting aside of where are we gonna get this guy, uh, that's a big problem already, but the next problem is he cannot use reason to teach this blind multitude. The precisely the reason they need him is that they don't have the proper use of their reason, don't know what's truly good for them, et cetera, et cetera. So he can't reason with them, so they're not going to get the first part of the social contract and go, ah, okay, right? They, they, can't, they can't do that. Maybe we can't do it either, but they certainly can't do it. So instead of reasoning them, and, he, and the legislator can't force them to obey because that would be contrary to the very purpose of the social contract, which is freedom, consent, right? So he can't reason with them. He can't force them. So what does he do? He appeals to heaven. This, this problem, is what has at all times, he writes, forced the fathers of nations to resort to the intervention of heaven and to honor the gods with their own wisdom so that peoples obey with freedom and bear the yoke of public felicity with docility. Okay? So religion is strictly instrumental, and it's obviously false. The religion, he's the, the legislator, lawgiver, is not claiming that that's true. He's attributing his own wisdom to the gods. He's the one who's wise, right? He's the one who knows the truth, but he can't persuade other people of it unless he makes it seem that the gods have taught it. Okay? So clearly not a matter of truth and clearly a matter of utility here. Now, religion, Rousseau largely drops the subject of religion to the very end of the social contract in Book 4, Chapter 8, on civil religion. It's the longest chapter in the work. When Rousseau gets to the point of uh, questioning religion, he looks at it solely from the perspective of its political utility, not from the perspective of truth per se, but is what religion would be useful. Okay? And he argues that we can divide religion into two types, two main types. He calls them the religion of man and the religion of the citizen. Now, the religion of man, according to him, is, quote, the pure and simple religion of the gospel or true theism. Okay? Notice that tr the religion of the gospel for Rousseau is a stripped down, basically, love thy neighbor as thyself. None of the other stuff, right? Stuff like divinity of Jesus, all that stuff, right? No, it's just the, the, the moral teaching, okay? And so it's similar to the religion that he's talked about in the profession. Meanwhile, the religion of the citizen is a strictly civil religion, like a pagan religion, the gods of Athens, right, which are restricted to Athens. The gods of Athens are one thing, the gods of Thebes are another, the gods of Rome, another kind, okay? And he goes about, to, and he says there's a third type of religion, the religion of the priest that gives us two fatherlands, uh, and he says that's useless, so he's not going to talk about it, <laughs> okay? So what about the religion of man and the religion of citizen? Once again, coming back to our imaginary two-by-two two thing, we have a problem, he diagnosed. Bluntly put, truth and utility are in conflict. Okay. So Rousseau says that the religion of man, the religion of the gospel, as he says, but, but, but basically the, the, a religion that's accessible to anyone is universal in scope, is true, he says. It's true. But the problem is it's politically pernicious, right? Because but as citizens, we need to be attached to our fatherland and believe in our fatherland if we're going to obey the laws, if we're going to fight for it, and so on and so forth, according to Rousseau, right? So while this religion is true, it detaches us 
from our own fatherland and therefore is politically dangerous. So from this perspective, insofar as he's talking about his Christianity, well, first of all, if Christianity means religion of the priest, he says it's worthless. If Christianity is the religion of the gospel, he says it's pernicious. Okay? So in this case, assuming we take him at his word, it's true but not useful. Right? It's over in the top right of this quadrant. Okay? What about the religion of the citizen? Opposite, right? The religion of the citizen, pagan polytheistic religions where the gods are the gods of the state, is false, according to Rousseau. Why? Because it's not universal and applying to all human beings, which is the standard of truth in this context. So the religion of citizens are, are false, right? But unfortunately, they're useful, <laughs> right? Because they attach people to their fatherlands in a way. You obey the laws of Athens in part because they are Athena, and the gods underlie these laws and other sorts of religious observances. So the religion of man, true but not useful. The religion of citizen, untrue but useful. What do we do? I think Rousseau's answer is there's not much we can do <laughs> other than try and cut the baby in two, so to speak. So what he does do is say, well, we need a civil religion to make our citizens dutiful and, and obey the law and act as citizens like they should. Right? But we have to keep it as close to truth as possible. So what are the dogmas of a civil religion that would be appropriate, according to Rousseau? Because, by the way, he does not think you can go back to antiquity in civil religions. And he doesn't want to go back either. But you can't go back because once the bottle's out of the genie, you can't put it back in. Okay? So he's got to deal with this problem. He can't simply punt. So. The few dogmas of the civil religion he outlines, he says, the existence of a divinity, the life to come, including the happiness of the just and punishment of the wicked, the sanctity of the social compact and the laws, and finally, no intolerance, no tolerance of intolerance. So we have to have a tolerant religion. Okay, so again, the existence of a divinity, the life to come, and those would be consistent with the profession of faith, largely, at least, but... Look at the third criterion, and the last one would too, no intolerance. But the third criterion or dogma is the sanctity of the social compact and the laws. In other words, somehow the laws we make in Greenville, right, as fellow citizens together, are not merely the product of our wills of trying to be free and make good laws for ourselves, but they're sacred somehow. How does that square, the sacredness of our laws as citizens of Greenville, square with the existence of one single universal God? They don't, right? So Rousseau is attempting to straddle the line of truth and utility here in a way that does the best possible uh, job possible and not lead to the worst possible outcomes, namely of uh, dividedness uh, due to uh, uh, the religion of the priest, as he puts it, or to the intolerance of fanaticism that he's um, arguing against. Okay? So it's a kind of jerry-rigged solution between truth and utility and religion. Okay? And insofar, again, as Christianity, for Rousseau's version of it, can be identified with the religion of man, his argument is that in his version of it, it's true. But it's politically dangerous. Okay? And as you put it, it can, can, in certain forms, be the religion of the slave. Okay, I'll end it there. And thank you very much. Yes, please. Okay, so the question uh, is, uh, the, the portrait Rousseau I've given seems rather Machiavellian. 
and that uh, Rousseau is using religion, among other things, perhaps, as sort of tools to, uh, to create a certain kind of state, whatever purpose that might have. And so how would I uh, relate the two of them together, um, apart from the fact, pardon? Relate either differentiating or not, and, uh, and what about truth, okay? Um, that's a good question, and uh, you may have noticed, those of you who have been reading The Social Contract or read it before, Machiavelli uh, is one of the few authors that Rousseau refers to in quotes. As a matter of fact, he quotes him on exactly the, the issue of all founders needing to resort to religion. So Machiavelli himself, excuse me, Rousseau himself, Shmiel Schmazel, um, Rousseau himself uh, explicitly points to Machiavelli on that point, which might be uh, you know, somewhat unsettling uh, in that regard. And he also, he refers to Machiavelli a number of times, too. Now, interestingly, also in the social contract, um, I believe book three, chapter six, uh, uh, if memory serves, Rousseau also quotes Machiavelli again. And in this particular case, uh, he adds a note in which he says, those who read Machiavelli's prints uh, and see him as a teacher of tyrants have misread him. Right? that the prince is a kind of um, satire of princes, and particularly the court of Rome, right? and that Machiavelli had to hide his opinions and was truly a Republican in his thinking. So Rousseau tries to square that circle a bit <laughs> by uh, sort of reinterpreting Machiavelli as even in the prince as a Republican thinker. Right? So, um, and to add to the Machiavellian elements, the, Rousseau's discussion of the lawgiver in uh, the chapter I was talking about, references some of the very same great princes that Machiavelli talks about, for example, in chapter six of his prince. Um, Moses, Theseus, Cyrus, Romulus, right? All of whom use religion in their own ways to help them in founding. So uh, once again, Rousseau uh, has a kind of Machiavellian basis, right? Um, the question of what Machiavelli's ultimate intentions are in his writing or writings is very, you know, difficult, uh, uh, difficult subject. Um, but I would say one way of thinking about Rousseau and a number of other thinkers who came after Machiavelli as well is um, Rousseau is, he, he seems like such a sort of romantic, dreamy guy on a certain level, but you look at him a little more carefully, and he's actually pretty hard-hearted, and pretty, hard-hearted is the wrong word, he's, he's, he's hard-boiled, right? And that's the kind of Machiavellian element. And again, without getting into what Machiavelli might have, there's a way in which you might say Rousseau unites a kind of hard-boiled, realistic view. For example, human beings for Rousseau are fundamentally self-interested beings. Right? So he unites that, that, that kind of thing with a kind of utopians too strong, I think, but uh, optimistic or idealistic way in a very interesting mix that you might say is an intention. How can you have this hard-boiled, you know, using religion this way, for example, as I've discussed, together with kind of aspirations for human freedom? I mean, maybe it doesn't work, but he seems to be trying to unite them. Uh, as for truth, Machiavelli famously says he's going to go to the effectual truth of things, not to the imagination of it. So Machiavelli's concerned with truth, too, but a somewhat different truth. Yes, please. Uh, of Pascal? Yes, yes, of uh, Pascal, sorry. That he's a good believe because if it's true that you can reap the benefits of someone having been a believer, but Rousseau is saying you have to analyze the utility more than the well, and he might say, you know, if you do believe, it might ultimately lead to you missing out on life and not being able to actually take the most useful path. So is that perhaps him more saying his disapproval of people who just say, well, flip the coin, believe in Christianity, and it's true evidence, and then it's life and eternity. Right, so the question, if it, I make sure everyone heard it, is, is the, the, the truth utility calculation in a profession elsewhere uh, referring to, or could, could we say it refers to, or understand it as a kind of version of Pascal's wager? 
uh, and uh, is it on the one hand indebted to it and to, or is it rejecting it, I'll put it that way, right? So that's, that's an interesting question. It's the advantage of coming someplace where you guys, a number of you have been reading the past calendar or so in ways that juxtapose them that I've never thought of before. So that's an interesting uh, question, thank you. Um, well certainly, In the, the, the context I've been discussing, Rousseau on religion, he is privileging utility. And we have kind of a big question mark over truth in a number of cases. Um, and he's kind of cagey about whether they're true, for example. Um, <clears throat> I think where the Pascal's wager might come in, in an interesting way, is the part I kind of, I left out but hinted at. Namely, what are Rousseau's own views on the subject uh, and that, again, I don't think we can ultimately know, because all the writings we have, he's conscious that he's writing them, right? Careful. It was animated. Um, I'm excited by the question. Um, so even those are difficult. But the occasions where he's talking putatively about his own religious belief, right? Again, maybe with a bit of not quite honestly. But, but let's assume there's something honest about it. <clears throat> At every single point, I would argue, including in the reveries, the passion I, I told you about him saying he was disturbed by the doubts of the philosophers, he went to investigate them, and he came out with something like the profession. In that case, in every other case that I'm aware of in his writings where he talks about his own views, supposedly, he says it's like a scale, right? You've got the arguments over here and the arguments over here. And he looks at the arguments and he can't make a decision about which ones are better, so he goes for the ones that are more consoling, <laughs> right? And so it's not exactly a wager. It's more like, you know, if I got to choose, why not choose the one that makes me feel better, right? And so consolation um, is the, uh, the moment that always tips the scale in his analysis. But of course, consolation is not a philosophic argument, or at least I don't think it is. Um, and uh, it, it, might be, it might be nice, but it isn't a philosophical argument. So, like I said, every time he leads us up in his writings to, to actually debate the sort of possibilities, right, is the universe a matter of chance or is it a matter of design, is what he argues in one place. He says, gosh, there are good arguments on both sides. I'll go with design. <laughs> you know, um, and so that's what he does. And that's a kind of Pascal's wager. It's a good question. Yes, please. So. Yeah. You referenced uh, when you mentioned Christianity as a as a sort of moral duty to um, to live in a land which is clearly like explicitly sacred. Um, I know I was reading through some of the book there, the Letter on the Cedars, where he talks about um, Geneva and their religion, and he very much sees that as a religion that's very politically neutral, um, and also. Okay, so the question again is that uh, Rousseau suggests that uh, the religion of man, as he calls it, or religion of the gospel, uh, is true but politically not salutary or even dangerous, right? How does that square with the fact that around him, including in Geneva itself, his hometown, that religion seems to be quite, you know, useful in promoting political states, right? Um, well, of course, there's the possibility Rousseau's wrong. Okay, but let's put that aside. It's not interesting. Um, and, and that is, I think Rousseau's answer would be this. That ain't the religion of the gospel, right? The, the kinds of Christian versions of Christianity, even in Geneva, right? But certainly not um, in France or other Catholic countries or largely Catholic countries because they have the religion of the priest, which he says is useless, right? Useless for what would be the question then, right? So I think Rousseau would say, yeah, sure, you're exactly right. Um, that Christianity as it's practiced, as it's preached, as it's used by these states, not to mention the Roman court, right, is useful, but not useful for creating free, legitimate governments and, and virtuous and happy people. It's useful 
for, for um, justifying absolutist and illegitimate governments, right? So you might say that the religion of man that he's, you know, he, he's kind of dreaming up here, uh, so to speak, is, never, is basically never in practice, uh, and if, right? Because where have you ever seen people practicing this, um, this religion of man, as Rousseau says it, without all these other dogmas, right? Apart from Thomas Jefferson, but that's a little later. Um, so, uh, you know, you might say, in a way, it's kind of a straw man argument on Rousseau's point. He puts up this painting of Christianity as a religion of man. He says, it's politically useless. And you go, well, but where have we ever seen it? Um, and I suppose he would say, yeah, you're exactly right. What do we see? We see these bad ones, right? Um, and so the choice is between bad and worse, I suppose, uh, choices here. Right? Um, I know that's not a very satisfying argument, but I, I think that the root of it is that he would say the Christianity that's being practiced is not the Christianity he's talking about. There was a question here. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, so the question is, Rousseau claims that man is naturally good or not naturally wicked, and he claims he's proved it in various ways, including through the education of Emil. And I believe the phrase you use is by leading Emil back to his original inclinations, right? So if, but he doesn't lead him back to his original inclinations. Instead, he creates this, this you know, incredible terrarium, right, of a controlled environment in which Emil grows up and, and certain kinds of passions and inclinations are fostered in him. So this isn't going back to what's original, and instead it's creating something new. Is that uh, more or less fair? Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, I guess I have, uh, there, I have sort of two answers to that, right? Um, related answers to it. One of them is, what does it mean to say man's originally good? Okay. If we mean by that some sort of time frame, like man back in the state of nature was good, or man as an infant in the case of Emil is good, right? then um, in order to go back to nature, we would in fact have to, to stamp out any developments um, in, in it. right? So Rousseau can't mean that being originally good or naturally good means at the beginning. He has to mean something like at the core, right? Um, <clears throat> and so something about our nature is not wicked, and it's the environment, the way we're raised, the way in which the passions develop in society that kind of diverts it from the core, let's call it, right? That makes us corrupt and wicked, right? So if we understand it that way, then uh, and, and the second part of the answer is, well, what does he mean by nature? Okay, and there's a passage in the very beginning of Emil, um, 43, is it 45? I don't know, it's 44. So <laughs> it's on the right side, and he, he's asked about what does he mean by nature? And he clarifies what he means by nature, and he says there, I don't mean what's original in the sense of a, a, a baby chick is natural, right? What I mean is any um, attributes, inclinations, passions, faculties, et cetera, anything that develops that is in accord with that nature, right? And so in other words, um, the project would be, the, the argument on his part is something like this. With the proper environment that prevents corruption, right, you allow the things to develop in a way that keeps him naturally good, right? So again, think of it as like a, uh, like a, a tree if you could only, if you can control the environment around a tree, give it the proper nutrients, you know, 
uh, the light and so on, then the tree would grow up straight and proper, right? So it's no longer the same tr tr you know, sapling it was before. Now it's a big, tall oak tree, right? And the only way you can have that happen is by controlling the environment. But if you didn't control the environment, then all kinds of bad things would happen to it, right? Uh, the wind would blow it and it would be doing this or it wouldn't get enough light and it would be kind of a distorted oak tree or something like that. So recall on the reason I'm using this image, the very beginning of a meal, he, uh, Rousseau uses the language of a shrub, right? So we get a tender little shrub, but we can't just let it go wild, otherwise you know, it's gonna get run over uh, in the highway of life, right? So we need to guard our shrub so that it can grow up properly. So this project is not to keep what's original, but rather to allow development in a way that's um, consistent with this natural goodness. So as an example, to prevent, we always have self-love. That's natural. It's inevitable. But how do we prevent that self-love from becoming pride or vanity, but instead a good form of self-love, as an example? It's a good question. There have been lots of people, you know, ever since Rousseau wrote, who want to you know, who say, well, wait a minute, how can it be that we want this original goodness given that we've gone away from it? So it's a, it's a puzzle, this thought. It's good to be picked up on it. Mm -hmm. I'm not as interested in the food as I am in the magic wall. <laughs> it's not as magic as I thought. I thought he'd clap his hands or something. Yeah, no? Wow. Um, so the question is the, it, an autobiographical kind of one, right? Or uh, autobiographical. Uh, yeah, so, the, uh, so, you know, I, as I mentioned, did not grow up in a religious household, you know, um, and then was surprised by what I read about religion being necessary, according to Rousseau, and other thinkers, too, of course. Um, So do I, do I agree that religion is necessary? Um, for most people, but not me. Now, um, what do I think? Well, I think, I mean, I certainly think, you know, just as a, a matter of fact, a sociological fact, you might say, is that, you know, despite the fact, the, what do they call the nunners? The nuns, people saying that they don't, you know, believe in or, or, or well, they shouldn't believe in, they don't affiliate with an organized religion. Despite that, as you all probably know, America is the most religious or certainly among the most religious societies uh, on the planet today. So, I mean, uh, maybe we should be more astonished by the, by the persistence of religious belief in face of all kinds of things, globalization, secularization, science, et cetera. So it certainly seems to be uh, a yearning, again, without speaking to the truth of the matter, it certainly seems to be a yearning for people. And it, that might be organized religions, it might be spiritualism, there it might be a whole bunch of varieties um, by what that takes. And it really, um, I think that, you know, sort of Rousseau's fantasies of what these atheists are going to run around and do all these terrible things are rather overstated. Um, but on the other side, um, well, they're confined to the West Coast and the East Coast. Uh, he said they don't do damage to the interior. Um, is uh, that so? I think that you know what he sees as some of the. He, I think he might overstate some of the dangers, but nonetheless, it seems that it is a really abiding and widespread need for people, and I I suspect that were lots of people who have faith and so on and so forth to lose it, that they, that I don't know if they're gonna go out and start like robbing and pillaging, but I think it really would be destructive to most people's happiness um, for a whole series of reasons, including the consolation and break on the passions that the vicar and Rousseau both talk about. So I guess I do incline to think that, uh, that, that, that certain kinds of religiosity at least are supportive of 
politics and certainly morals. Um, certain other forms, not supportive and quite dangerous uh, uh, to it as well. So I think, uh, coming back to it, I don't know if I, I certainly don't think I have the answer. But what I would say is that those questions that Rousseau and other people asked 250 years ago, uh, yeah, two, 200 years, 250 years ago, some amount of time ago, um, are still alive. They're, they're questions still. We have not answered these questions. And that's what I find most interesting. 